there's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls, and far out on the hills we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news! And Isaiah says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king. And that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Amen. Our God still reigns. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning for those who are here in person and everybody who's joining us online as well. We're in our fifth week of this series that we're titling Missional Anatomy. We're studying the anatomy of the Christian life because like in physical anatomy class, By studying how we are put together spiritually, we can begin to understand the purpose for which we are made. God's made us to be interactive creatures, given us the ability to relate to the physical world around us and to relate to him in relationship. Even deeper, he's invited us to be active participants in his mission. Why would he do that? Like, why would he need us, right? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. And yet, he condescends or comes down to our level because he desires relationship with his creation. And he wants to involve us. He invites us in to be active participants in his mission to establish, or maybe better said, reestablish his perfect kingdom through a people that he is perfecting to ultimately restore all of the created order back to its original perfect creation, kind of like the Garden of Eden. Perfect creator relating with perfect creatures in his perfect creation. So we've already seen in this series that God has built our spiritual anatomy with, number one, a mind to be reconciled or aligned with his mind under his leadership his headship, his rule, and his reign. We've been equipped with spiritual eyes to see Jesus for who he really is, King of kings and Lord of lords, and to see ourselves as who we are in him. Though first he often reveals to us who we are without him to draw us to himself. That's what we saw in the life of Isaiah the prophet a few weeks back. He's also equipped us with spiritual ears to hear the call that he places on your life and on mine. Like a grand overarching call and voice for direction for our lives. You know, statements like, what's the purpose of life? To know God and make him known. Yeah, God has placed that call in your life, that overarching meta-narrative, right? Like, to know God and to make him known. But also, spiritual ears to hear that still, small voice, that daily, moment by moment, leading of his Holy Spirit, like, go talk to this person in the store. Deliver this encouraging word. Pay for this guy's food at the gas station, right? Ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Last week, we looked at our hands, equipped with tools, simple as they may be, to be submitted 
to him to be used in his way and in his time and for his purposes. God asks of each of us, like he did of Moses that we read last week, what's that in your hand? He's like, a stick. That's all I got. (laughs) And God said, lay it down. And then God empowered him as he surrendered to the will of God and said, pick it up. And through that empowered tool, God used Moses mightily in the deliverance of his people. As you might have pieced together already this morning, we're going to turn in our anatomy textbook to the chapter on feet. Did you know there's a chapter on feet? As we continue our anatomy lesson this week, I want to introduce you to an ordinary guy. And I have to find the right book of the Bible to do so. This guy... He's so ordinary, we might confuse his name with a few people here in our congregation. This ordinary guy's name is Phil. Not Phil Beasley, and not Felipe, and not Philip from wherever he said he was, now that he's shaven. Uh, But Phil was just an average guy in Scripture who was called by Jesus. We first encounter Phil in the first chapter of John. Uh, If you want to go there and read the details later, you can, but for time's sake, I'm just going to summarize with a few observations from John 1. This guy, Phil, um, was not the first disciple to run to Jesus. That was Andrew. Phil was also not the small pebble who would be transformed into a great rock of faith, that was Peter. In fact, Phil was not even the first one in his hometown to respond to Jesus. In fact, the text in John 1 says, like Andrew and Peter, Phil was from Bethsaida. <laughs> like he was, he was the third runner, <laughs> even in his hometown, to go to Jesus. Nothing outstanding with Phil. No special attributes or characteristics, or talents that we can see. Jesus doesn't make a particular declaration over Philip when he comes. So pretty much Phil was just like you and me. Just ordinary guy called by Jesus. But Phil used his spiritual eyes. He saw Jesus for who he was. When he encountered Jesus, or rather when Jesus encountered him, he knew this guy's the Messiah. He used his spiritual ears when he heard Jesus call him and say, follow me. And he used his spiritual hands. He used what humble tools he had to introduce others to Jesus. Okay, turn. I can't, I can't resist. Turn there with me. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse like 39, I think. I'm going to pick up in 39 maybe. Jesus said... Um, no. Thank you. Forty-three. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, "Follow me." Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip then found Nathaniel and told him, "We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law." And about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. Like this is the way Jesus called Philip. Hey, come, find out what's going on. You want to follow me where I'm hanging out? Come and see. And that's all Philip tells to Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, come and see. This Philip starts off pretty ordinary, but I think he ends pretty extraordinary. 
I believe this is the same Philip that we see in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Now, I want to be cautious as I go in because I know there are a lot of Bible scholars who do not think the Philip in Philip the Evangelist of Acts chapter 8 is the same Philip as the Apostle Philip here in John 1 and later in Acts 6. There's two primary reasons. I got to warn you right off the bat. I'm going to get, this is a passage I get Bible geeky about. So if I just start <laughs> wigging out on the Bible geekiness, I'll warn you in advance here. Um, there's two primary reasons why scholars, some scholars think this is not the same person. Number one, Philip the disciple was among the 12 in Acts 6 when the 12 said, they gathered all the disciples together and they said, it's not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn the responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And Philip is named as one of the seven who is selected to do this table ministry, right? And so scholars say, well... The disciples, the 12 apostles, selected seven other men, so this must be a different Philip, right? So that's the first reason they, they decide that. Secondly, when Philip the evangelist can, makes converts in Samaria, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit until Peter and John came from Jerusalem and laid hands on them. So scholars, some scholars say, uh, therefore it can't be Philip, who was an apostle, because he would have already done that before John and Peter got there. So that's their two primary reasons. But I've got reasons uh, to believe that it actually is the same person. Um, there, there is biblical and historical evidence that makes it plausible, maybe even preferable, that the apostle Philip of John 1, that we just were introduced to, is the same Philip the evangelist of Acts chapter 6 and chapter 8. They are one and the same person, I believe. I'll give you just a few of them, and then we'll dive into why it matters when we get into the text later. Here's the geek alert uh, right here. We've got ancient testimony identifying them as the same man. So, Papias of Hariopolis. You know him, you read all his stuff, right? Uh... <laughs> He's a second century writer who had spoken with some of the apostles personally. He speaks of, how is that possible? That's a quote that I just read. How is a second century apostle speaking to the apostles? Yeah, so he must have been second or third gen apostles that he was talking to. Interesting. No, I just caught that as I read the quote. Anyway, second century apostle who, spoke, who had spoken with some of the apostles speaks of Philip of Acts 21. This is Philip the evangelist who's mentioned there again as one of the apostles. So he includes him with the title of the 12. Another, uh, Polycrates, a second century bishop of Ephesus, says that Philip, one of the 12, was buried at Hierapolis along with two of his aged unmarried daughters, and that a third daughter, a prophetess, was also buried in Ephesus. In Acts 21, verse 9, we know that Philip the evangelist had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. It seems a little unlikely that two Philips would both have unmarried daughters who are in the office of prophecy in the church. Now, I guess it's possible, but it's kind of improbable, right? Um, so that, that's some of the ancient testimony that we have identifying them as the same men. Secondly, biblically, it's quite possible that Philip, as one of the twelve, would volunteer to be one of the seven chosen to work the tables in Acts 6 as a liaison between sort of the elder board and the deacon board, right? This is not a crazy uh, practice. We do this frequently even today. Uh, we'll identify one of the elders to be in charge over this thing. So it's not unheard of that something like that could take place. Uh, and there's a few interesting aspects of that. Philip, actually, in John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, is specifically named there in that account. 
So maybe he had some unique giftings in distributive tasks and giftings. I don't know. We don't know. That could be a reason. What's more, during Jesus' ministry, when in John chapter 12, when a group of Greek-speaking Jews wanted to talk to Jesus, they first went to whom? To Philip. Philip was a good choice, apparently, when dealing with Hellenistic or Greek-speaking Jewish matters. So it doesn't, shouldn't surprise us, I don't think, that in chapter 7, when these seven were originally appointed, what was the reason? Because the Hellenistic Jews were complaining that their widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. So who do we call in? Bring in Philip. Why Philip? He's the one of the disciples with a Greek name. Have you noticed that? Philip is not Hebrew. Philip is Greek, and it means what? Philip. Lover of horses, that's right. Apparently, and that will actually come into play in chapter 8, maybe. Yeah, so he's the one disciple with a Greek name. So it might not surprise us uh, that he's called in, called by the Greek-speaking Jews to get an audience with Jesus back in John 21, and then here that he volunteers to be one of the seven to deal with this Hellenistic issue that's happening within the new church. Third, and then my geeking is done. What about his converts in Samaria? Why would he not lay hands on them himself so that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit if he was an apostle, one of the 12 who was filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Why wouldn't he do that? Well, we know, even as, what was the criteria for the seven men who were selected? And? And? Filled with the Holy Spirit and? Wisdom, thank you. Full of the Holy Spirit of wisdom. So, the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So, there's actually no difference. Whether he was an apostle or whether he was just one of the selected, he, the criteria to be selected was that he's full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Philip may well have thought it wise to get the endorsement of other apostolic leadership to bring the Samaritans into the same experience that they themselves had received at Pentecost. Remember, there's still in this early church divisions between Jew and non-Jew. Do these non-Jews have to follow all the same rules that us Jews have to follow? Lots of tension still. And so it shouldn't surprise us, I don't think, that Philip would say, hey, let's get the endorsement of the Jewish uh, apostolic leadership on this new group of believers in Samaria. I think all of those reasons, and probably some more that I could geek out about, but I won't bore you with, um, are reasons to really think that I, I believe this is the same Philip from John 1, Acts 6, Acts 8, and Acts 21. So turn with me to Acts chapter 8. We're going to read about Philip. All of that was introduction. We'll see how far we get. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution. On what day? What precedes this? The stoning of Stephen. Stephen was one of the other, another one of the seven who was selected for that same task in Acts chapter 6. He was giving... Um, given the task of waiting tables and wound up being the first martyr. So uh, that's a whole other sermon series. I won't go there. On that day at Stephen's stoning, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. 
Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention and said, With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the promise that accompanies your word, that it will, will go forth and it won't return to you void without accomplishing that for which you have sent it. And so, Lord, we pray this day your word would have your way in my heart, in my mind, in my family, and in our church family today. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you notice the progression here? From Philip's humble and simple come and see invitation in John 1 to proclaiming the Messiah, driving out demons, and declaring the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 8. That's quite the growth trajectory. From simple steps of faith and obedience... Empowered by the Holy Spirit comes courage and a holy boldness, a depth of understanding and growth in grace and in power. Don't overlook that little phrase. Philip proclaimed the Christ there. Continuing in verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave them their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Skip down to verse 26 with me. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met, the Ethiopi met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was on his way home, uh, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Okay, that sentence right there floors me. Like all this time, I'm assuming they've pulled over to the side of the road, you know, the rest stop between Jerusalem and Ethiopia. But they're rolling in the chariot. Do you get that? Because here in 38, he gave orders to stop the chariot. So all of this conversation and discipleship is happening on the road, like in the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. 
When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is such a great picture, this passage, of how the Lord often communicates with his people, unfolding more and more of his revealed will as we take steps of obedient faith. Look at verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go to this intersection. That's the instruction. That's it. You know that road down there by Gaza? Go there. That's all he's told. He doesn't know God's purpose. He doesn't know God's timing. He has no idea what's about to happen. And so, what do you do? What do you do when you get a weird, a weird sense like that? I mean, this is a, an angel of the Lord revealing something. That should probably give you a level of importance, right? But what would your first reaction be? Mine might be, uh, why? Where, now? Or can I, hang, can I eat breakfast first? What, like, what am I supposed to do when I get there? I don't know. Just go. That's the instruction. That's the level of clarity that Philip has. Go. And what does he do? 27. So he started out. Okay. All right. I don't know why I'm going. I don't know what the purpose is. I don't know how long it's going to take to get there. Maybe he didn't know how long since he knew where the road was, apparently. Uh, I... I don't know what's going on. I, I'm just going to go. We'll start out. So he start out, started out. And on his way, he met the Ethiopian eunuch. And then 29. The Spirit told Philip. Here's second instruction. First one was, go to this intersection. Second one was this. Go to that chariot and stay near it. That's where I would have failed the test, right there. Chariot's rolling. The instruction to Philip is, catch up with the chariot and stay with it. Like the Nelsons probably could have done that. I would have failed the test right there, right? Like like Emily, she would have been right there. She's chariot side. Like I'd have been huffing and puffing. But that's the second instruction. Like, this is weird, right? Go to, this in, go to this intersection. Second instruction is, go jog next to that chariot. These things sound strange. When he does this, again, he obeys. Here's the principle in these first two sections, right? Obey and await. Like, okay, and await further instructions. Notice Philip doesn't like take it into his own hands and go, oh, I know what he must want me to do. Therefore, I'm going to like fill in the blank for God as though God can't figure out the rest of the instruction, right? We do that. I do that all the time. Like I hear the first half clearly and then I go try to fulfill it in my flesh because this logically must be what God wanted me to do. Let me tell you, it would never occur to me to run next to a chariot. That would not have been the follow-up that I would have filled in the blank with. And I would have missed it. Why? Because I didn't obey and await further instruction. Look at verse 35. Uh, Let's back up. So Philip, in 30, Philip ran up next to the chariot and heard him reading. Do you understand what you're reading? How can, like, this, this also astounds me. Because they're having a conversation while running. Like, this doesn't happen for me. Uh, 
Peter asked me to go jogging one time, and it's great. We can have conversation. We talk, and I'm like, clearly, you've never run with me because there's no talking happening when I'm running. I'm like huffing and puffing and spitting and wheezing. There's no talking happening. This, however, there's a conversation going on. He's running next to the chariot. Hey, do you know what you're reading? How can I know? Uh, who's the guy talking? And he reads the whole passage while Philip is running next to the chariot. Then he invited him in. Thank the Lord for that. Invited him up into the chariot. Verse 35. I love verse 35. Philip began with that very passage of scripture and he told him the good news about Jesus. Like Philip didn't come pre-equipped with, um, with his five spiritual laws or his step up the life track, all both great tools and I used them. But like he didn't have a sermon prepped, right? He just followed in simple obedience. Go to this intersection, run up next to the chariot, and he overhears him reading the book of Isaiah. And so he goes right from where this man is and explains the gospel to him, beginning with where he's at. It reminds me of what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 4. We were back there last week in chapters 3 and 4 of Exodus. In uh, God told Moses, now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth. I love how it translates that in the New American Standard. I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. You see, Phil, ordinary old Phil, saw with his spiritual eyes who Jesus was. The Messiah. God's Messiah come to God's world. He heard with his spiritual ears the call of Jesus on his life. He saw in his own hands the simple tools he had been given. Maybe he'd been given a unique ability to bridge the gap between Greek-speaking Jews and Hebrew-speaking Jews. And so he used it for the glory of God and his kingdom. But he didn't stop there. Philip chose in simple faith and obedience to walk out what the Lord was asking of him. And what was the result of this simple obedience? Salvation for whom? but ultimately for who? Do you know? This, yeah, all of the continent of Africa was Christianized through that one contact. All of the continent of Africa in their day. Can you imagine if God had begun his instructions with, hey, Phil, I want you to Christianize Africa. Right? Right? Like we ask so often in our prayers, God, give me the big picture. Give me the, give me the whole thing so, so I know where to go. What would you have done if God said, Christianize the continent of Africa? <laughs> I'd be like, um, I don't think so. Are you nuts? There's no way. And I guarantee nowhere in your plan would have been go to this intersection and run next to this chariot. Right? It just wouldn't have happened. But because Philip chose in simple faith and obedience to respond to the promptings of the Spirit of God in the moment, not understanding their full impact. Maybe he never understood the full impact of that one spiritual transaction that took place in the life of the eunuch. And neither do you, and neither do I, understand fully the ramifications of every personal encounter we have on a day-to-day -day basis with the chariots we run up next to.
yeah, there are still strong and deep ties to this, to this seed that was planted in this one man's heart. Simple obedience to a single series of simple instructions opened the door to the gospel for an entire continent of souls. So the question for you today is, how are you walking out what the Lord is asking of you? Are you hearing things of the Lord that just don't really make any sense? And so we brush them aside. I I have so many things to do, right? Like that intersection, that's a long way away. That's like on the other side of town. Really? I'm going to be in that neighborhood tomorrow anyway. I got to run some errands over there, right? And so I'll just... I'll do it tomorrow. Man, how many times do we do that when we just get this little Holy Spirit nudge to go, hey, go talk to your neighbor, right? So how are you putting feet to what the Lord is asking of you today? Isaiah 52, 7 says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. I loved the the imagery that was shown by the guys from the Bible Project in that video. The feet are lovely, not because they're pretty, right? Because they're probably dirty and mucky and bloody from the, from the courier running from one place to another over the mountaintops to get the message to the people. Why are they beautiful? Because the message they bring is beautiful. So how are we walking out what the Lord is asking of us as individuals? And furthermore, how are we walking out as a church family what the Lord is showing us? A couple of years ago, the Lord planted a seed in our hearts uh, as leadership about reaching the neighborhood that we're planted in. And we're walking that out in a variety of ways, even as we speak. This week was the last um, after Tuesday after school clubs that we are running for the year in conjunction with Campus Life that just ended this Tuesday. And let me tell you, what began as a gathering of a meager four or five kids the first few weeks ended the year with a consistent group of 25 to 30 on Tuesday afternoons from the Anderson Middle School across the street, consistently hearing about the love of Jesus and glimpses of the gospel. Many of them took Bibles home to read. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we had a great opportunity. They invited a few of the leaders in to, um, as a Q&A, just a question and answer time, and they just asked us poignant spiritual questions about what's your history with church and God, and how did you come to faith? And, and so like four different people got to share their faith stories with these kids. So thankful to the leadership of Chad and Tana Cartwright and the volunteers who are assisting them there. As a church body, the Lord also led us to embark on a potential of a multi-use sports court that uh, we might be able to equip our home base to better engage uh, our church family, yes, but even more so our neighborhood. Last year, you might recall, after asking the Lord for confirmation of this direction, Mac received an anonymous donation of $50,000 to the church. The board approved that 30,000 of that go to the fellowship hall and 15 toward the Hoops of Hope project. Uh, because at that time we thought uh, the bids that we had, that was about half of each of the projects. 
Then in December of last year, we were notified of another $15,000 grant that was awarded to the church for the Hoops of Hope project. This year, as we refreshed bids, we found out that concrete costs had like almost doubled, um, increased significantly over the last year. We set out to pray for how the Lord would have us to proceed. Is this a sign that we shouldn't? Is this a sign that we should press in? It's like the, Lord, the Lord's um, um, incremental revealing of his will, right? We go, okay, we're, we hear you saying this, so we're going to take this step, and we don't know where we're going exactly, but we're going to take this step of faith. And so we set to pray for how the Lord was going to have us to proceed. And a couple of months ago, Mac received another donation of an additional $20,000 that the elders decided to use for that project. So in light of these confirmations and blessings and the continued giving of individuals, we have individuals who are consistently giving toward this project, the elder board approved moving forward with the hoops of hope for this summer. With what we have in hand and with what people continue to give toward the project, we should be able to complete actually kind of phase one and a half. We were thinking we'd be able to do uh, the two main goal posts, and then maybe next year come around and put in the four side um, goal posts. But because of uh, the donations and those who are giving, it looks like we should be able to complete phase one of the full size court concrete installation, six adjustable hoops, and painted lines. It has been and continues to be an amazing. Um, display of God's hand at work in this, pro in this project. And it's just a slab of concrete, right? Kind of like Moses, what's that in your hand, right? It's just a stick. I mean, it's just concrete on the ground. But how is God going to empower that tool to be used for his kingdom's sake? I want to let you know the site work to prep the site is beginning Tomorrow. Did you know that? Amen. Yes, we can rejoice in that. They are beginning tomorrow. And I'm going to do something weird at the end of the service here. So to close the service, what we're going to do is we're going to walk out there. And we're going to circle up in the court area and just pray. Pray for, for God's anointing. And that simple tool as we lay it down like Moses this did, lay down that stick and just say, Lord, however you want to see this used for the expansion of your kingdom purposes in this neighborhood and in this city. I'm also in communication with local and national sports ministries to begin to coordinate a, a targeted summer ministry uh, some ministry opportunities for our neighborhood, like a week of basketball camp. Um, I would alt I'd love to see us eventually do a, a spring camp, like right now when, when uh, school gets out, and then maybe another one before school starts in the fall. We can't do that, both of them yet this year, but we may be able to get one in by the end of the year uh, in conjunction with a couple of these ministries that we're in communication with. So this morning, I'm just going to ask us to close in this unique way. And we're going to move our feet. And we're going to, I just want to ask you to join me and walk out to the ground where the court is going to be and pray together as the Mac family for the, the Lord's anointing and blessing on his kingdom effort that he is so clearly unfolding for us. And like Philip, we don't know the next steps until we take the step that's before us. And so we're just holding it with open hands and saying, Lord, we want this to be used any way that you see fit. And so Lord, empower us as your people to follow in simple obedience. Can you join us out there? Let's head out and we'll close in prayer out there.